So I'm Jan Visser, um, principal editor of a book on uh, seeking understanding, the life of pursuit to build a scientific mind. Uh, you were one of the authors, Paul, of that book. So um, Paul Webb is sitting with me and we're having a conversation on that chapter. We are in a place here called Wilderness in the province of the Western Cape in South Africa. Your profile on the website of uh, Nelson Mandela University, where your professor reads, Paul Webb is a distinguished professor of science education. His research interests are in the fields of the understanding of the nature of science, classroom discussion, teaching science in disadvantaged schools, and currently in developing new insights into the notion of scientific literacy. I presume that's still correct. When you talk about science in this connection, um, that means what we traditionally understand as science, physics, chemistry, biology, and then in addition, mathematics and technology. Uh, that's the major area. So my first question to you is, um, what has motivated your interest in and passion for those particular subjects? Or is there perhaps one particular subject that you uh, you particularly feel attracted to? I think, like with most of us, it goes back a very long way. It went back to a teacher at school. And it was actually physics. It was, I remember, it was calorimetry. Mm -hmm. And we had um, these little lead balls and we could get out the specific heat. And we had thermometers and we read it and we did the calculation and it worked. <laughs> and uh, the second part is it's not only that, is I live next to the ocean and I used to spend a lot of time um, in the rock pools and uh, along sandy beaches and I, in the end I became a marine biologist. But as well as that, it was the educational institution in East London, uh, the museum, the East London Museum, mm -hmm. where my nature study teacher was Margaret Courtney Latimer. The, she was the lady whose name the, the coelacanth is named after, Latimera Chalamna. Latimer from her, sina, uh, her surname. She found this fish and got J.L.B. Smith to come and have a look at it. And uh, I spent many, many hours in the museum on my own, looking at the exhibits and becoming interested in talking to people. Yeah, so the fact that things work, in, as you mentioned, in physics uh, and in those other disciplines, that is a, it's a major feature. And you can't say that of many other areas where we try to understand things. And you have very clear evidence always in the natural sciences that yes, it works, and it's a, because it is a very satisfying feeling that one derives from it. Um, we first met in the Stellenbosch um, at one of the colloquia on building the scientific mind that uh, my institute, the Lerbeen Institute, was organizing. In 2011, we were in Stellenbosch, South Africa, uh, again, the province of the Western Cape, and you chose to participate in it and you again chose to participate in the next colloquium in Lembang in Indonesia in 2013. Um, now, as we worked on this concept of the scientific mind um, within the context that uh, my institute was trying to promote, uh, we clearly wanted to go beyond the meaning of the scientific mind in the sense that this is the mindset that scientists have. So we are looking beyond science itself. Uh, did that particularly appeal to you? It, it did appeal to me very much. Um, one of the reasons is that although in science you can sometimes get results that are very satisfying, there are other times when it's very messy. And uh, I can remember when my first zoology paper, which in those days you posted, you sent three copies, to typed pages, no, just typed <laughs> manuscripts. And when I put it in the posting box, I wanted to pull it back because I thought, I don't know that this is true. And uh, it bothered me. And uh, my head of the department at the time, I discussed it with him, and he said, 
but that is the case of the crea creativity in science. Um, read this book. Uh, it is called What is This Thing Called Science? With a picture of a Cheshire cat on the cover by Charles. And realizing that science is actually a very, very creative thing. Uh, really appealed to me. I know in mathematics you can get things right because we make the rules. Mm -hmm. In science, we try and fit our understandings to what we see. And I think that is one of the reasons uh, that so many people are not attracted to science, is because they believe that it is something that they simply need to be able to know and understand. They don't realize that it is, in science, it's trying to understand what sense someone else has made it of phenomena. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, the putting together uh, the, the ideas of creativity, of being creative, and that creativity is, is also stems within what you do with other people and how you converse with them because uh, you can only be creative in a creative type of language. Mm -hmm. In your chapter, you write about talking, thinking, and understanding. Yeah. Are those things related to each other? Did you say, are they related or how are they related? How are they related? Well, I think that a long time ago I was intrigued with what comes first, talking or thinking. Do you think mm -hmm. or does it come from the words? I remember we were talking about those issues in, uh, while we walked in uh, 2013 in Lambang. And the, uh, <laughs> That's right. And those notions were not talked about by scientists, you know, philosophers and language people. And, and it, it intrigued me. Uh, can you have thought without language? Uh, can you have language without thought? Um, I don't think so. When you talk, you can talk in many different ways. You can talk without listening. Uh, you can talk without thinking, and uh, you can talk without giving anybody else any space to affect your thinking. But the kind of talk that goes on in a scientific situation, in an authentic one, is uh, where people discuss ideas and they criticize and they critique each other's ideas. And in doing so, um, naturally we always think, well, we had that idea in the first place even though we have changed our minds. When we have an argument, you always come to the position where, uh, so now, now young, you can see my point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but your, your mind has changed, your point has changed. Mm -hmm. So it does, for me, um, the way you talk and how you talk does affect the way you think. And the mm -hmm. way you think will definitely help you in the way that you understand. So the, the, the concept of productive discussion mm -hmm. is central in your chapter. Uh, when would you call a discussion productive and when would it be the opposite of it? Neil Merce and Rupert Vagor um, have worked a lot on looking at how people speak, you know, discussions, and they called it exploratory talk. It's where children explore situations and this kind of talk um, is not, they can define what it's not, it is not the normal disputational talk. You say something and I say, no, that's wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like this. And you say, no, it's not. It's like that. The other kind of talk that you often find in classrooms and societies is cumulative talk, where you want to please people. And you say something and I agree with you, and I may not even understand it, I don't question it, but I say, yes, you're right, and add to it. So the kind of talk that they were doing in exploratory talk was to get to people to question each other's thinking or to explore their thinking and to also uh, make explicit what they were thinking. But it is within a system uh, of rules, rules of the game, mm -hmm. where um, you, every person needs to be allowed to, be, to talk. Everybody's position must be respected but not agreed with. Um, where um, you must give reasons for what, what you are mm -hmm. saying and that you can come to some kind, kind of consensus position, hopefully. It's, 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 so it's not just talk, it's, it's not actually just talk. listening is a, an important component of it and interpreting. Listening, mm -hmm. interpreting, challenging, yeah. ch challenging your own thinking.
and even feeling perhaps the feelings the personality of people who plays a role. And, and that, that's why one of the, the rules is respect other people's opinions, uh -huh. not to get negative feelings. Now this has been going on for quite a while um, and there are a lot of people who have been talking about discussions in classroom, small group discussions, whole class discussions, and uh, if you, the literature, if you bring it together, there, there are a lot of names. Some people call it explanatory talk. Other people call it uh, mm -hmm. children's, the philosophy, uh, uh, children's philosophies, um, the thinking aloud uh, activities. Um, and, but if you put them together and you look at them, they all come up with the same essence. And that is of putting ideas forward, other people putting their ideas forward, co-producing an understanding. Mm -hmm. So it's generative. It's generative. Something new appears thanks to that kind of discussion. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, now, obviously, as you mentioned, this, uh, there's a lot of talk sometimes. And, uh, well, there's always talk go going on in classrooms. The worst case is that only one person is talking and everyone else is listening. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the teacher. And, and, you, <laughs> and you hope they are listening. <laughs> because they may, be, they may mm -hmm. be daydreaming and that may be better for them actually mm -hmm. than listening mm -hmm. in such cases. But um, then there, uh, so if there's really interactive talk going on, it's not necessarily productive talk. Very often it's not. Yeah, it's actually the teacher's role to facilitate and guide the talk without yeah. being intrusive. Mm -hmm. um, because there can be a lot of talk, obviously, um, about the so last night's so soccer game or whatever else, or even about the work. But if it is not, uh, if it's not productive and productive, I like the term productive. Uh, it came out in a, uh, it was put together in a in, in a booklet. In a book that has recently come out from a conference by Astahan and Clark and, and another author, I must get it there, okay. where they put it all together. And um, it just, it sounds like you know, you're looking for a product or you're or making something happen, but it is, is something that happens that produces. A positive growth in the way that you think. This is the book that you referred to, the chapter that uh, resulted from this uh, conference on, on research yes. promoted by the American, American Association, Association for yes, exactly. Educational Research. Yeah. That's the one. That's right. Okay. Resnick. Uh, Resnick, as they meant, okay. of course. <laughs> my apologies to them. <laughs> I don't have all my references at my fingertips. Yeah, no, yeah. Right, that's good. Yeah. Obviously, yes. And the, so the, 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 the profound pedagogical implications of, uh, yes. of doing that. So you're asking yourself, how can you make that happen? Uh, is that, uh, are you going to uh, emit a circular to the teachers that uh, uh, henceforth they should, etc., etc.? That would probably not work. It wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> I wish uh, we could, but yeah. Yeah, it would So, what, uh, how, how, how can we move out of this uh, tradition that we have of uh, unidirectional talk or non-productive talk? Uh, to productive talk. It's something that needs to be done and we know from, gen from decades of working with teachers that much of the training as it's called, the education of teachers uh, and in service when they are actually teachers teaching and well into their careers often doesn't, is not really productive um, but it is probably the best way that we could get into it is by uh, developing programs su such as many people are doing, but um, getting this into levels where there is some kind of uptake and commitment by authorities, governments, education departments, such as the main and the part, right? Uh, Hands in the dough, the French yeah. translate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. That mm -hmm. one it seemed to have had a great effect in France. Mm -hmm. It was supported by the Academy and by the French government, yeah. and it was long term. On another level, is and often there's not a transfer to from the academia down to teaching, but there's a lot of work being done now which relates to it, 
um, which is the, based in socio-cultural theory, right? People look at what people do and they explain, they're trying to explain what happens. And much of that work has been very, very successful in getting things to happen into the, in the classroom. Um, where children learn, uh, you know that that way of teaching or um, managing a classroom makes a difference, but they do not really know how. The role of the cognitive scientists, the cognitive psychologists, which was so popular 50, 60 years ago, mm -hmm. seem to have been pushed into the background or been even counter to. You know. yeah. I don't believe they are counter to one another and um, I think in the chapter I've written a bit about how cognitive issues are, are understood and although that many cognitive in issues have been understood they haven't been able to be used to produce uh, effective programs in classrooms or in schools while on the socio-cultural they do these things but they can't explain them so probably what I'm looking for in the future is to try and get the cognitive scientists and the socio-culturists together um, as an idea, not me personally, but uh, for yeah. it to happen so that there can be a greater understanding and then greater publicity and somehow get some political will so that people understand that this kind of teaching and learning is important. There, there's been a tendency um, to reduce the role of the teacher, uh, to de to degrade it to the to the level um, of just facilitating, facilitating you know, the guide on the side. That's right. uh, it's not that because if you want productive talk, it's a cooperative phenomenon, isn't it? And there there are different parties involved. You know, to be able to do that, the teacher. Um, Firstly, it has to be quiet at times, yeah. but it's a very, very skillful yeah. job that needs to be done to get children or anyone to understand what it is and to be really excited and to be really curious and to pose the questions, to uh, understand when children are going into a blind alley, uh, to be able to ask the kind of questions that, that lead into excitement and, uh, and make make possibilities in the classroom yeah. that, that, like I said, like uh, when I did the um, specific heat experiment, the school had enough little copper pots and you know, lead balls and thermometers for us to be able to do it, and the teacher knew what could be done. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that that particular teacher wanted any, any sort of discussion in the classroom just to do it, but um, it is that which is needed. Teachers need to be confident in what they're doing, uh, know wh what they're aiming at, what such a discussion would be. The fact that they may not have an answer is not the end of the world, uh, but that looking and it's discussing... It's the beginning of the world. It's the beginning <laughs> of the world, yes. And uh, it is something that teachers need to be able to, to be introduced to, to experience for themselves. Yeah. And then to feel the difference um, that it it makes to get some real understanding, mm -hmm. not 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 book understanding. And that things may work out differently also. Yeah. There's a, um, a book that I've recently been reading. It's called um, "The Beautiful Risk of Education." It's written by a philosopher of education, mm -hmm. Gert Bista, uh, mm -hmm. I think. Um, he argues that. Um, in all those events in an educational setting, they need to represent weak connections. So the communication process needs to be a weak process in the sense that it leaves things open. Yeah. And you can't um, say, if, if it's your goal as a teacher to convince your students of something particular, then you don't give enough openness. So, uh, you you have to take that risk that they take it somewhere else. And I think you're working in a country where you have different cultures, all kinds of different cultural interpretations of nature, particularly. Uh, so you're dealing with a, a diversity of mental settings that students have 
Um, how, do, how does that work out in, in, in the case of South Africa? Oh, in South Africa is particularly complex. Yeah. Um, it, it, it really is. And I've often sat with teachers who, um, when you look at electrostatics and lightning, um, yeah. and then I've asked them when there's been a, a level of trust, uh, tell me now, uh, where, does the fun, uh, where does the lightning bolt come from? And they can describe it in positive and negative charges and earthing and uh, say, and what about uh, witches? And they say, do you know about that? Yeah. No, no, mm -hmm. Of course that is the case, we, we know that. Uh, but we didn't want to mention that to you because we weren't in that context. We were talking in the context of teaching science. Now, in South Africa we have that, we have different traditions amongst many indigenous people, we have different religious interpretations, even even Christianity and for a large proportion it's of the countries mixed a, 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 a little with the ancestors. Um, it's not quite what someone in Holland would consider, some Protestants in Holland would consider to be yeah. pure. Uh, we then have other, even, we have other religions, we have uh, the way of looking at the world if you are in Islam, the way of looking at the world if you are a Western person. And um, there are many, 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 as we know, people who have living more than one world. Should we see it as an advantage or uh, as a problem, this diversity? Um, I think it can be used to an advantage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember reading a paper um, the Canadian situation where they brought up the local traditions and ideas in the science classrooms and looked at them not as not judgmentally uh, but to see um, what are these ideas and how do they fit in with the idea of a pure Western idea of being scientific or of how the local indigenous um, Native Americans see these phenomena. Do they fit together? And do they clash? If they do, what does it mean? And it, uh, from the from the literature I read, it, it opened the children's minds. Mm -hmm. They enjoyed science much more. They achieved better. They knew what they needed to answer yeah. when they were asked in the science. I can imagine way. actually having different ways of looking at the world. Uh, if you entertain all those different ways of, of yeah. looking at the world and uh, each of them becomes more specific and you are able to recognize the particular advantages of uh, seeing the world in, uh, like the way that uh, natural science sees it. Yeah. If you can distinguish it from, from those other elements. Yeah. It's some, somehow the same as when you speak different languages. And yes. <laughs> you know, so you, there are things that you can say in French and you can't say them the same way in English and vice versa. So, yeah, it's, I think it's a, um, it's a very interesting chapter that you wrote. It's, um, it's one that will uh, contribute, I, I expect, greatly to, uh, uh, to continue this debate. And um, uh, if it's a certain, what, what would be your your own uh, desire as to what happens with that chapter, what the, 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 about the impact of that chapter? Well, firstly, I hope someone will read it. And when they've read it, <laughs> they will then go and look at some of the other references um, and see actually how pervasive this idea is amongst the literature. And that uh, these ideas, they will then take these ideas to more people. Yeah. And in their institutions and in their societies, they will try and, and push to include this way of looking at things, at least in part, in, in, in their curriculum, mm -hmm. teacher training, in schools, in their yeah. life. Okay. Well, Paul, thank you very much. Thank it was you, a great conversation and I'm glad to have met you again. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure we will continue our, uh, our own conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, the production of this chapter was very much a productive conversation already. So thank you for thank you very having much. played that role. <laughs>
Thank you for your patience. <laughs> okay. Thank you.